Hello to everyone and thank you for watching Mid-American Gardener. It's great to be here. I haven't been here for a while and it was something to do with traveling and a bit of a bug that I, and it wasn't an insect. Not the good type of bug. <laughs> Not the good type. So anyway, I'm glad to be here. I'm Diane Nolan and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois, Illinois and it's very invigorating. It's the beginning of the semester. So you'll see some of us invigorated um, college folks here that are enjoying our new semester. If we have questions on cut flowers or perennials, I might answer some of those, but we have some talent here on set today and they have other expertise. And so let's find out who's here and how you might direct your questions towards their expertise. So I'm gonna take it away and throw it over to Dr. Bob Skirvin. So I'm, I'm Bob Skirvin, I'm a professor at the university and I, I started teaching yesterday and I'm really glad to be back with my students. It's really nice, it's really, really is invigorating and it's fun and it's just, they're always surprised they like horticulture. They, they kind of- That's right. The surprise. Okay, anyway, so I got a, uh, some I wanted to show you here and and wh what it is, I was in the, in the grocery store today and I saw something in these little packets, uh, these little baby, baby cut carrots, you've all seen those and eat them all the time. And, but uh, what they had today in this one was uh, some, it was the multi multicolored. And so here's a red one and there's a, a yellow one and there's the orange one. And I, I thought that I saw a green one in there somewhere. But, get, you know, but they got diff different kinds of carrots and it certainly makes a beautiful pack in here and it's really fun and, and I, I would think for lunches it'd be nice to have it have a change of pace all these different colors here and the red ones if you never had the red carrot they're really sweet they are really surprisingly sweet but one thing i will tell you if you try cooking with these things the pigment all leaks out and they're, they're it's, it's like beets they're related to beets and it leaks out and everything turns a horrible color it just <laughs> <laughs> so they're, they're best eaten fresh just kind of cr crunch them down and enjoy them and <laughs> don't don't cook with them. I always enjoy growing those because you never know what you're going to pull. When you pull it out, sometime you, you just get a variety. What, what, what do you call these carrots? Is it a surprise pack or something you're talking about? Oh, no, it's just um, the purple one may be that red dragon or uh -huh. something Yeah, there, like there are that. varieties. You can, you can, you can buy them in the catalog. You can, you can plant your own. I grew a rainbow mix. Yeah, it's that's just what, a yeah, generic yeah. name was rainbow mix, and it's really fun. Some are white also in those rainbow mix. Well, thank you for bringing those. That's a nice yeah. springtime yeah, thing. Yeah, first time I've seen them like this. No, I've not seen them like that either. No, I haven't either. Okay, well, since we've chatted a little bit with Kay, <laughs> let's go ahead and introduce her. This is Kay Carnes. Hi, I'm Kay Carnes. I'm a Champaign County Master Gardener, and my areas of interest are uh, heirloom vegetables and seed saving and herbs. Great. And I have an email tonight from a listener, uh, Dennis, and he said, <clears throat> you have mentioned a couple of times that you mulch under tomatoes in the spring. What do you use? Just thinking ahead. Well, um, there's a whole list of things you can use. My personal favorite is grass clippings. Um, they make a really nice mulch. Uh, obviously, they're easy to come by and they're cheap. Um, as long as you want to just want to make sure that the yards haven't been treated with any chemicals. Um, other things you can use, you can use newspaper, you can use chopped up leaves, you can use cardboard. Um, sometimes you can, people will combine the two. <coughs> um, you know, you put down a layer of newspaper and maybe some uh, leaves or grass clippings on top of it. Um, there's just a whole list of things that you can use. I like the grass clippings because they actually fertilize as well as mulch. Mm -hmm. And then <clears throat> I don't clean it up in the, in the fall. I just leave it and then uh, till it in and it, it really ends up making a nice fertile soil. Um, I sometimes use compost that mm -hmm. is at the bottom of the compost pile. And I used aged bark chips, whatever. Yep. And those are brought to my house for free so <laughs> they're also free as well but and all combinations mm -hmm. of those that you've mentioned and I've well, mentioned. Well, your aged bark, how long do you age it? Well uh, I like to have it at least three months but sometimes it's dropped off in the fall mm -hmm. and it doesn't get used till spring mm -hmm. so sometimes oh, it's so it is not, it doesn't have to be like years. Oh for, no. For we're our talking. blueberries we used to do that but we, we let it sit for two or three years. Yeah we compost yeah. and then it's really. Tough. No you can see w once <coughs> the steam is off it really does heat up and then by three to six months 
I don't ever get them used the minute they get there, so it's mm -hmm. usually about half a year by the time I get to them, but not everyone has that much space, so if you're going to use less age, then you want to use the cardboard, the newspaper to keep a, a barrier, because it will rob the nitrogen out of the soil. And if you have bluegrass, the grass clippings are fine to do that with, but if you have fescue, you should not use grass clippings because they will have black cutworm eggs on them, which those will hatch out and the larvae will cut off your tomatoes for you. You just <laughs> concentrate a yard full of black cutworms in it. But black cutworms don't do well on bluegrass, so you're not likely to have mm -hmm. eggs on black cutworms on bluegrass uh -huh, clippings. I, I never heard that, that's interesting. Yeah. One of those little nuances yeah. above you, bug them. <laughs> and if you're mowing crabgrass, I don't think you'd want to be using crabgrass. They don't care a whole lot for crabgrass. <laughs> well, I was just thinking the yeah, additional you don't seeds. Want to add the seeds. You don't yeah. want to add the weeds to it. Yeah. We are really getting ready for tomatoes to ans <laughs> answer a question, and we <laughs> like that. <laughs> okay, well, let's get ready for you, Dr. Phil Nixon. I'm Phil Nixon. I'm an extension entomologist in the Department of Crop Sciences at the University of Illinois. And I have, a, uh, have an email question about uh, spider mites. And uh, it says that uh, actually we will switch because we have a different one up. I wondered how that was gonna happen. We have a bug ID. It says, I have found a number of these bugs around my house in Arlington Heights. I don't think it matches the description of a marmorated stink bug mentioned on the show last week, but I thought I would let you all decide if not, not that bug, what is it? Love your show, thank you, Pat. What you're seeing is a leaf-footed bug, and if you notice uh, kind of at the top right of the screen, you can see that the, that the back leg of that insect is widened out into a, into a leaf shape. And these are several different kinds of insects in this group. Uh, they're about an inch long and, the, and flat on top and brownish. Uh, the most common one is the western conifer seed bug, but which has gotten throughout the entire country. But there are also other, uh, other leaf-footed bugs, and these will come into the house, kind of like box elder bugs do, or things of this nature. Uh, about all you can do is try to seal them out and remove them as you find them inside. Normally, it's not a lot of them. Uh, but they feed on lots of different things. Even the western conifer seed bug doesn't restrict itself to conifers. So basically, if you have shrubs or trees around your house, you will have these out in your yard. Uh, so you can't just get rid of everything and go with AstroTurf, so you just put up with them <laughs> to a certain extent. We have had a little bit of concern in recent weeks uh, about this insect because a somewhat similar looking insect called the blood-sucking cone nose made national news associated with it. Uh, it transmits Chagas disease in Mexico. Remember it said Mexico. Uh, we do get that bug in in southern Illinois and places farther south. Interestingly enough, it doesn't get into southern Indiana or Kentucky very much. Uh, it does get in Kentucky, but southern, southern Missouri much, except the Boot Hill region. Uh, but you have to have both a vector and a disease, and the Chagas disease is not known outside of Mexico, so it's not mm. a problem. But again, the leaf-footed bug is not carrying disease, does not bite people. It's one of those things that you pick them up and toss them back outside. It is an infinite world of insects. That's why I'm in it. Wow. <laughs> Never always something new. We will not talk bad about insects anymore. Oh yeah, you will. Okay, all right. Well, I thought maybe I would turn over a new leaf. <laughs> it's, it's okay. Actually. Okay, all That right. leaf is brown on one part. <laughs> okay, fine. Well, thank you for that. And let's go to our Did You Know quiz next. You can distinguish a flower fly from a bee by the number of wings. A fly has two wings, while bees have four. Pollinators. Both and are excellent pollinators. Both are excellent pollinators. We are just full of insect activity here today, <laughs> or information. Let's yeah, hope well, not activity. We have to dream about them during the winter. <laughs> yes, we do, well, or not. <laughs> okay, well, let's go to the phone lines, and we want to answer Paul's question or comment on line two, and it's about winter tree transplanting. Paul, this sounds interesting. Are you there, Paul? Yes. What's your question or comment? I have a question on a potted tree that's got uh, a trunk about, uh, I, I'd say it's probably two inches. Um, mm -hmm. Will it, I mean, it's still in the pot, uh, will it dorm it out and just 
be okay to plant in the spring? Your best bet with that would be to, if you can dig into the soil, would be to probably put uh, put pot and all down into the soil to the uh, top of the pot rim and mulch around it and and leave it there until spring and then plant it properly. It's uh, You can plant trees in the middle of winter, but you don't have a real good success rate. And this method of sinking the pot down into the ground will help keep it from freezing and thawing too much, breaking roots, because if you leave it out and it gets freeze and thawed too many times, what it will do is it'll leaf out and look real good in the spring, and then after about two or three weeks, all the leaves will die and fall off, and you will have a dead tree. So uh, protect that root system. It's not as hardy as the top is. And we're gonna have some freeze and thaws where mm -hmm. he could get to it and possibly near some mulch or, right. or some area of debris where it's a little less frozen because right. that could be challenging to yes yeah. and if you can't get it in then then uh, then protected from the winter sun I overwinter my bonsai in pots um, on a on, on the east side of a house and then uh, mm -hmm. and we put leaves around the base and then as it gets uh, this kind of temperature we now have straw over the most mm -hmm. of the top so that can be done above the ground but you have a much better chance if you can get that root system down in the ground where all of the soil around it, it's okay if it freezes, but it just doesn't want to freeze and thaw, freeze and thaw, freeze and thaw. That's what really breaks roots and kills the tree. Okay, very good question. And thank you for that answer. Let's go on to line three, and Marilyn has a question about house plants. Hi, Marilyn. Uh, hello, uh, This um, I'm calling about, and I'm not positively sure of a name, but I was told it was an umbrella palm and I have had, well, actually, it's not my plan. I've been babysitting it for about 15 years for my granddaughter. Oh, but wow. It, but, but, but it's real lanky. And I mean, it's on the tips of the, the branches has got, or the stems have gotten pretty long on it. And, and they have nice-looking leaves on it. But, but maybe from where it comes out of the ground, uh, it could be oh, maybe two to three feet before I have any uh, leaves on it. So I was wondering, can that be cut back? Okay, so you've got an umbrella palm, which could be a dracaena, do you think? Or do you think it is an umbrella palm? Well, if it's an umbrella palm, it's possible. I know dracaenas will break from the base, but I'm not sure that palms do. Does anyone have any experience with umbrella palms? I would almost wait till we have a house plant expert on there. I'm not sure about it. It's not my expertise area. Yeah, I really don't know either. Uh, if you want to send us an email <coughs> about it, we will have it answered on the show in another week, and we'll put up the screen uh, so that you can see where to send your question to. And if you even take a little snapshot of it and attach that to your email, then we can see a little bit more about it. But I know Dracaenas you can cut back and they'll branch, but I'm not sure about palms. Well, I, I know, in the case of palms, and I, I can't propagate palms either, but a lot of plants, if, if you get like that with all the leaves that are going here, if you take the tip up here, the part that has leaves on it, and you can kind of bend it over if you want to, is an easy way to do it, and put it in soil, maybe cut a little bit. And, and layer it, it. And it will layer it. It will, it will root at the, at the end, and then you cut that part off, you got, then you got a, a plant, and this part back here will sometimes branch, and you'll have more, lots of plants where you can throw it away too if you want to. And, and it could layer into a, a, sec a second pot. Yeah, that's a good idea too. Yeah, so that's let me try now. Palm, I don't, I don't, I don't think palms work like that. So yeah, and and, and true palms like the uh, like the big palms out in the southwest and in uh, California and so on. When the palms get too tall, the royal palms, what they do is just cut them off and stick the end back in the ground at roots, mm -hmm. and they start out again. But again, we need to know exactly what you're calling an umbrella palm, whether it's a true palm or it's something that's called an umbrella palm, the common name has got us to where we don't know for sure how to answer the question. Right, so send us that because we'd like to answer that question and we're curious about what the plant is. And thank you for babysitting that plant for 15 years <laughs> for your grandchild. That is, that is really that great, Marilyn, I appreciate that. I enjoyed that a <laughs> lot. Okay, well we're gonna go to Carol's question on line four and she has a question about acorn squash. Hi, Carol. Hi. I picked in the fall, brought it in and set it in a cool room in the house. And then they were mostly green when I picked them, and now they're all orange color. Would they 
still be good. It's probably a little old. Um, that's what they do when they really, really mature. Um, the, I would just suggest trying to cook one and, and see, you know, how it turns out. Mm -hmm. You'd have nothing to lose. Um, that's just, you know, aging for the squash itself. Right, it's not poison or anything. It's no, just, no, it's just, just probably old. Old. I've might be eaten easy numerous to uh, yellow acorn squash and ones that had turned from, from green. green to yellow, and they're fine as far as I'm concerned, or orange. So, well worth trying. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for that question. And let's go to Katie's question on line two about Christmas cactus. Hi, Katie. Hi, thank you for uh, taking my call. You're welcome. Um, someone gave me a small Christmas cactus for uh, Christmas, and it had a few blooms on it, and then some of the blooms fell off, uh, and then all the blooms fell off, and it's just sitting there in my west kitchen window and um, I don't know what to do with it. Should I just leave it alone? And uh, I water it when it's dry to the touch, and that's it. That is perfect. That's watering what you do. It, <laughs> watering it when it's dry to the touch, just yeah. barely down under the ground. And this is more of a time to rejuvenate for Christmas cactus. Mm -hmm. And you know they will set their f um, flowers when it starts to get cool and um, less day length. And so they flower Thanksgiving, Christmas, and this time of the year. And then once the flowers are off, and they may have dropped because of a change in humidity, change in light level, if you got it as a gift from the greenhouse to your house, it may have dropped earlier, but it will, you know, I put them outside and I let them be outside all summer. And then when I realize it's starting to get quite cold, possibly even frosting, I leave it out on my porch until then and then I bring them in. So you just get to enjoy it as a green plant and start to let it get larger. Anyone else want to chime yeah, in on Christmas cactus? That sets it off. So you have done well with your, I have one that's doing the same thing. Uh, mine ended up being two together. I don't know if I propagated two in the same plant, but I have a, a reddish color Thanksgiving one and a pinkish Christmas one together. Right. I didn't know I was so organized. Didn't mean to do it. So anyway, there you go on your Christmas cactus, Katie. Let's ask one more answer one more question before we go back to the emails. And Bob has a question about winter tree trimming on line five. Hi, Bob. Hi. Thanks for taking my call. You're welcome. And uh, I'm just wondering. I got uh, crimson maples and hard maples and stuff. Does it hurt to trim? main branches back late in the winter months? I'm going to look at everyone on the panel and together we're going to say yes. <laughs> I'll say no. <laughs> You're going to say no, no it doesn't hurt? Because Ooh, particularly thinking. with maples you have a I'm risk thinking. of having sap flow if you prune too early and and, and have I was some thinking this was out. too early. Do you think it's not too early? Well I, th I think that that was my concern was that uh, generally I think with maples they recommend pruning after sap flow has, yes. has occurred. And so I don't know whether you can do it earlier in the winter or not, but uh, that would be an exception to the rule that this, normally winter pruning yeah. is fine, in my opinion. Yeah, but it was the sap true. flow that I was concerned okay. about, so I don't know. I mean, it's a very frosted time, so it may not have the sap flow right now, but it's February when... They do s they sugaring, yes, in Definitely February, avoid so it's trimming maples February, March, yeah. April. Yeah, it may be fine now. It may be. I would just be careful and try one and see what happens. Or do it on a, uh, uh, don't do severe pruning. Uh, when you don't have any leaves on the tree, it's a great time to, to see the structure of a tree and do the pruning and so on. But uh, with maples, you need to be a little on the, on the cautious side. So perhaps uh, moderate pruning, but not real heavy pruning should be fine. Okay, next it's year, really... Next year you do more, once you learn more about what happens. Right, uh huh? Exactly. So just kind of notice what happens with a couple cuts and then be prepared for what you will take care of. So we didn't disagree, we just don't know when the best time right. for the sap <laughs> flow because we both were thinking about that. Well, we're gonna go back to some emails or show and tells and I'll start with you, Bob. Okay, I have a question here that's uh, from Jim of Geneva. And he says, I have a red raspberry patch and it's, uh, Good size, but can I cut it back? And how short can I go 
when's the best time to do it and can I dig out some of the plants? Well, uh, red, red raspberries, the way red raspberries grow is they send up root suckers. So you plant one plant and they send un underground shoots and they start coming up and they, they, they get thick. And in fact, it gets to be a real problem if you, with the raspberries because they, they can take over your backyard. They really spread a lot. And so it is a really perfect time to prune the plants. And uh, what you do is go in and uh, first of all, decide how much you want. He says it's five, five foot wide. And that's pretty wide. It's hard to get mm -hmm. in there because they're kind of prickly. And to pick it and see, you might want to cut, cut it back to three feet or something like that, and then let it, let it expand back into that area the following year. Anyway, and then with the red raspberries, go in and uh, every square foot you want about those oh, six, six to ten shoots. And what you do, the the best fruit production on red raspberries are the biggest ones, the biggest diameter. And so take out the little skinny ones, cut those out, and leave the big ones six to ten per square square feet. And then in term, terms of height, they start flowering right at the tip. And so I don't know how tall they are, but if, if you can keep them at five, five, five or six feet, mm -hmm. they're probably, probably all right. Because they'll start right at the tip and they, they move right on down the plant as, as they flower. So if you cut off the top, you're cutting off some of your major production there. And uh, go from there and yeah, you can do it. Then the question was, can I dig up some of these plants and move me out? It, it'd be fine. I think right about now, they're, it's probably, they're probably frozen in place, but, but soon you can, you can dig them up. Mm -hmm. and, I don't know, the roots really aren't very deep. So cut a good six, eight inches into the soil, you should be able to get a nice root ball, and a nice root, root mass probably, and move that, that'll be fine. Very good, it's making me think of things I need to do soon. <coughs> I'm making notes. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. Uh -huh. And now Kay. Okay, well I have another tomato question. Um, <clears throat> this is from Lawrence and he says, I watch your program from the Chicago area. I have a question regarding plum tomatoes. Every year, just before the fruit is ripe, my plum tomatoes drop the almost ripe fruit and they are damaged. This happens particularly after rainstorms. Are there any varieties of plum tomatoes that don't prematurely drop the ripening fruit? Well, um, fruit drop in tomatoes is generally a result of stress to the plant um, because um, the stress causes the plant to want to you know, heal itself and, and fruit isn't, um, when you get fruit on them, that's, it's stressful in itself. So they'll drop that fruit in order to, you know, preserve the health of the plant. Um, and this is common, um, well not common, but um, it's particularly water stress. So either too much or too little rain. It can also be due to cold, uh, especially night cold. Um, so that's, that's something to look at. Uh, over, over fertilization will do it. Um, and also there are some variety, hybrid varieties that are actually bred to drop the fruit early to make mm. them easy to pick. So I would look at, um, you know, how much water, you say it especially happens after rainstorms. So I would, <coughs> excuse me, question your drainage you know, perhaps you're not, your plants aren't getting proper drainage and that's causing the overwatering stress. So, you, and you might look, I don't know what kind of uh, tomato he's growing, but you might look at a different variety, something like a San, San Manzano um, tomato or, you know, some of the other, um, even the heirloom varieties. So those are all things to take into consideration. I found it was interesting when we were in Germany, they would have tomatoes that have uh, a structure over the plant itself. It was open to, on all sides, but they had a little structure over it so the direct rain didn't oh, get on it. I thought that was interesting. Huh. <laughs> oh, that is. A little bit of s shade, but also from rain protection. But huh. it came, everything else it could come in. I don't, very interesting. It was at some of the universities there. Yeah. They were trying it. Huh. Well, anyway, good question and thank you for that answer. Mm -hmm. Phil, on to you. Uh, I have an email that says my alocasia poly had spider mites. I didn't know what an alocasia poly was, <laughs> but it's one of the plants that has been formerly known as elephant ear. Uh, it says I mixed dish, dish detergent, water, and cooking oil together in a spray bottle, found the remedy online, killed the mites, will they return or are they gone for good? One good thing to know about spider mites is spider mites are never gone for good. Uh, they flow through the air, they come in through screens, they, they will find your plants. And so, uh, so that's a factor, but they will feed, suck out the sap of the plant 
and uh, and you'll get little little uh, white spots that can then turn brown. And I would recommend that rather than using a concoction like that, you would buy find use something that has been used associated for house plants and other plants. That would be insecticidal soap. Using dish detergent is likely to kill leaves and plant, so you need to be careful associated with that. Spider mites also like very dry conditions, and so if you can increase the humidity, move plants together so it increases the humidity around them, it, the mites will get fungus and die, and you won't have <laughs> spider mites so much. So those are all ideas you can do. So you're trying to promote fungus? By to, increasing moisture around the leaves. Uh -huh. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So now you know what an allocation is, and we know what to do with the mites. Some fungi are good. Some harm yeah. your plants, others harm your bad bugs. Isn't that interesting? Okay. Very good. Well, we have enjoyed hearing all of your questions and we have discussions about yeah, it. it's really fun to interact. So we thank you so much for being a good audience. If you do want to send us emails, feel free to do so. Thank you three for being on today. I appreciate it. We hope that you have a great week gardening, possibly indoors. Bye-bye.